Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on electric company strategies for reducing climate and weather related vulnerabilities. My name is Daniel Knoll and I'll be our moderator for today. I'm a senior manager for international programs at the Edison Electric Institute and it's my pleasure to be able to have on today's webinar uh, three individuals from San Diego Gas and Electric which uh, was the recipient of the 2018 Edison Award, which is uh, our association and our industry's uh, flagship award for uh, leadership and innovation in the electric power industry. Today, we'll have three speakers, uh, Katie Spears, VP for Electric System Operations, Augie Gio, the Director for Emergency Management and Aviation, and uh, Katie Giannichini, Meteorology Data Scientist, all with San Diego Gas and Electric, who will be providing uh, some information and answering your questions about the investments that SDG&E have made to uh, bolster resiliency in their operations and uh, in implement a comprehensive fire mitigation strategy. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, this is a webinar uh, which is part of our global webinar series. We, in addition to the U.S. members we have here in the United States, EEI also has over 70 members around the world. Our next upcoming webinar will feature one of our international members uh, who was the recipient of the International Category Award uh, this year for their uh, Smart Internet of Vehicles EV Charging Network project. So next Monday night, if you are in a convenient time zone or just really looking for something else to do at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, then you can learn about what State Grid of China is doing with their EV charging network in the Shanghai region. In addition for today, if you have questions that you would like asked to our presenters, then please use the chat feature on the right of your screen up at the top. You can submit questions to me in writing and I will do my best to get through as many of them as possible within the hour. And finally, a recording of this uh, presentation will be made available on our YouTube channel and if you are interested in learning more about what EEI is doing through its international programs, uh, please contact us and subscribe to our newsletter to receive those updates. So with that, I will turn things over to our presenters, and uh, I believe Katie Spear, you will begin. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you, Daniel. So this is Katie Spears, Vice President of Electric System Operations at SDG&E, and today we just want to cover our um, evolution of our wildfire mitigation safety program and the different uh, three prongs that we focus on in that program and the situational awareness tools are minimizing ignition effort and suppression and outreach. Those are our three, three different areas. And joining me are Augie and, and Katie to go into some of the details on the fire side and on the weather side. I'm gonna talk about our evolution and um, some of the, the early points of our, our uh, work on wildfire mitigation, and then we're going to go into some of the detailed tools and efforts that we've taken, especially collaboration with the communities. And then finally, we're going to look at a case study from last December when we had a, a severe uh, weather event here in uh, the San Diego area and how we, we dealt with that using our, our mitigation program. But first, I want to I want to take us through our evolution, and this is our first slide, slide number two. And initially, we, we've had at least two very, very catastrophic events in the past uh, 20 years, and one was in 2003, and then one was in 2007, and they were just massive wildfires in the region. Uh, starting uh, prior to 2003, we were really just, you know, focusing on our compliance. So our utility commission and making sure that we met the standards that were laid out, uh, vegetation management standards as well as inspection and maintenance standards. Uh, the 2003 fires occurred and uh, we, as I said, it was very devastating for the region. Our EOC was activated for, for days on end. Our folks were out uh, repairing for repairing and restoring service for, for days, which led us to 
uh, really focus on our initial fire effort. And so at that point was the, when we, we initially started a, a fire coordination program, brought in a former fire chief uh, with you know, many years, over 30 years of, of experience, started partnerships with some of our local agencies, uh, and then it worked on some of our early customer communications. Then in 2007, we had a reoccurrence. We had uh, three major fires in the area and a, a very difficult uh, weather situation in 2007. Uh, these fires, again, um, you know, we were uh, indicated as potentially involved in some of the, the fires at the time. Uh, we went through a whole regulatory process after that, and so I think some of you may be aware of some of the uh, challenges that the investor-owned utilities are facing in California, and utilities in general, publicly owned too, uh, as far as uh, the legislation and the regulatory environment. But after 2007, we made a commitment and a core uh, corporate goal that we would have no wildfire ignitions from SDG&E facilities that would cause a catastrophic wildfire in our region again. And to do that, we began several steps. Uh, a very, very aggressive hardening program and in our highest fire risk areas, including uh, increased spacing of clearances, increased uh, conductor sizes, replacing wood poles with steel poles, uh, undergrounding in very select areas, as that's you know not necessarily always the the best option for hardening, uh, and just in general looking at every single way we could uh, improve the system on our transmission and distribution side. We also worked on advanced situational tools, which Katie's going to speak to quite a bit as far as our, our weather and meteorology uh, focus. At that time, we brought in our subject matter expert meteorology group, uh, folks who had been with the National Weather Service, folks with graduate degrees in meteorology, uh, uh, somebody who had been a, a uh, weather uh, newscaster previously uh, and had a great meteorology background. We also worked on our operational protocols related to reclosing, uh, de-energizing for safety if we needed to uh, in the case of a high-risk situation. We brought on dedicated firefighting resources, contract resources, and we also brought, and those would be field resources, and we also brought in aviation support. So that was our focus after the 2007 fires up to today, and then I would say up and actually till last fire season when all of California saw significant change, significant change in the, the severity of the fire risk in Northern California and Southern California, and again, as we faced some challenges on the regulatory front. So at this point, I would say we're focusing on several different areas. We continue our efforts to continuously improve with hardening, situational awareness, bringing in additional uh, professional staff on fire science and emergency management. But we're also really taking a uh, role in driving the policy and the standards and, and actively being a leader with our utility commission, with our, our legislative body, uh, with our governor in the state just to make sure that you know, we can really push uh, the best practices across the, uh, the state. Uh, we are also uh, working on our customer communications. I would say that was one thing that we really learned out of our December event is that our operations and our infrastructure is in tremendously good shape. We will, or we will be working closer with our customer base and making sure that our communications are, are more effective. So moving on to uh, situational awareness, and what I'll first talk about is the first effort that we had to undertake early on was mapping the highest risk fire areas, and that was critical in order to figure out exactly where we needed to uh, really place our weather network, place our sectionalizing tools, really what, what were the areas where we would need to have crew staged. Just having that information was a critical first step. and. We took that critical first step, divided it up originally into what we called the fire threat zone, and then a portion of that, a subset, was a high-risk fire area. And this was a result of uh, fire coordinators, meteorologists, and assisting, you know, assistance from fire agencies. We're, we were all collaborating together to determine those highest-risk areas. And you see now, actually, the, the PUC had made a requirement um, to, for all of the utilities to actually undertake this. 
and that was uh, finally uh, approved last December. All the utilities are providing these high fire threat district maps now, are developing them uh, with tier two and tier three. What was very positive for us is that our, our high-risk maps already matched almost at 99% with the high fire threat district map that was issued um, for as, as a result of the resolution with the PUC. So we really, we based our operational protocols on this map. We based our, our fire hardening efforts. We based our, a, our everyday crew operations and what kind of contract firefighting resources are need, needed. We based much on this map, and that's why we wanted to start with that because that's fundamental to, to really being able to develop and build out our system. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Katie to go into some of our situational awareness tools. Yeah, thank you, Katie. So as you heard, um, back in 2003 and in 2007, we had severe fire events that um, were essentially fueled by Santa Ana winds, um, which for our area mean very hot, very dry winds um, that, of course, can lead to catastrophic wildfire growth. From a meteorology standpoint, as those fires were occurring, there were 17 weather stations within our service territory that were reporting weather conditions once every hour. Um, when it comes to operating the grid, you know, these weather stations were located in airports, at uh, fire agencies, offices, you know, places that were um, convenient from a federal standpoint, but not necessarily from a private sector standpoint. So one of the meteorology group's first initiatives when we were first developed in 2009 was to begin developing this network of weather stations across our service territory. Um, each one of these weather stations is installed directly on our power poles. So you can see an example of that in the image on the right here, um, where we have temperature, wind, and relative humidity, relative humidity information that is um, being recorded and disseminated to us and to the public every 10 minutes now. So when we first started out, we put one weather station on every one of our circuits that was located in um, what is now called Tier 3, that highest risk fire area um, that was determined for our service territory. And now because we have um, so many long-spanning circuits and so much of a need to understand what the weather conditions are doing across our service territory, you know, understand how the wind and temperatures are impacting our electric infrastructure. Um, we now have 172 weather stations that have been installed within our service territory. Um, and we are, uh, we do have plans to install another five by the time fire season hits us in earnest on September 1st of this year. Um, so like I said, all this data is made publicly available. Um, anybody from, you know, a resident who wants to mow their lawn and maybe know what the temperature is doing in their area to our first responders, fire agencies who are out battling these conditions, um, trying, to, um, trying to put out wildfires. We make sure that everybody has the situational awareness that they need. So once we had all of this information, you know, taking weather information from 170 plus weather stations every 10 minutes leads to a wealth of data. Um, the next step, or the next question really became, what do we do with this? Because we didn't, we wanted to make sure that we were using it to the best available um, cases possible. So we ended up partnering with UCLA. Um, they have, they're the nearest um, university to us with a weather or a meteorology program. Um, and with them, we were able to uh, begin tweaking government-issued weather models to become more in tune to our service territory. So essentially, we calibrated these models to our weather data so that we could have better predictive ability for everything from Santa Ana wind events to hot, humid, monsoonal weather events to even uh, winter storms with uh, heavy rain and strong winds. So this has given us a, a very great understanding of not just what the weather conditions are doing, but also what the fuels are doing, how the hot and dry weather impacts the fuels and dries them out um, so that we can also begin tracking when we will be uh, essentially ready to burn, when our, high fires, or our highest um, fire times of year are occurring. Once we had all these models in place, uh, we then worked with UCLA again and the U.S. Forest Service to develop the Santa Ana Wildfire Threat Index. So for us, you know, if you hear that there's a Santa Ana wind event occurring, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to have this 
high threat for an extreme fire event. Um, you know, you can have Santa Ana winds once you've already received uh, abundant rainfall. So your grasses are green, your fuels are wet, and they're not necessarily going to carry fire very efficiently. Or you could have a very light wind event, but everything is extremely dry. We've had no rain for months. Um, so what we developed was essentially a way to rate Santa Ana wind events. So say you're a resident in Florida and you hear that a hurricane will be approaching the peninsula. One of your first questions as an emergency manager or as a utility company is, well, you know, how strong are we looking in terms of hurricane strength? Are we looking at a category one or a category five? Well, that's essentially what the Santa Ana Wildfire Threat Index does for Santa Ana wind events. Um, it rates these, it takes into account the weather information, so how strong your winds are going to be, um, how low your relative humidity will be, and combines that information with your fuels information, so how dry your grasses are, um, how much moisture is in the dead parts of vegetation, the little sticks and twigs that are laying on the ground that you would be picking up to maybe create, to build a campfire, and how much moisture is in the living parts of the vegetation, how much um, water have the leaves of your uh, chemise or your vegetation out in the back country taken up. And then using these factors, we're able to rate a Santa Ana wind event on a scale from marginal to extreme um, across all of Southern California. And this product is now disseminated daily by the U.S. Forest Service and, again, is made available to the public. Um, in our most recent case um, that we'll actually be talking about, our December wind event, um, we began seeing this product disseminated by the National Weather Service and even by national news agencies, um, just highlighting the potential for extreme fire growth down in Southern California. Closer to the utility home, we built something very similar called the Fire Potential Index. So this index takes into account very similar information, your, um, your humidity, your winds, and then all of your vegetation factors. Um, and then rates it on a green, yellow, red scale. So this is a product that we have um, broken off by our eight operating districts. And we're able to give this forecast um, out seven days, just giving the company a heads up of what kind of fire conditions we're expecting. So for your green case, it's typically during the winter, you've received um, enough rainfall to begin um, begin generating a green grass crop across our highest risk fire areas. Um, you know, our, our plants have taken up enough moisture, so we're not necessarily worried about any sort of wildfire growth. Um, any ignitions that start would have a very hard time carrying. As we get into our elevated, our yellow risk, um, that begins to indicate that a fire of about 250 to 5,000 acres could occur um, if it were to occur in the right spot at the right time. Um, so this begins to tell us as, on a, a company level of what type of operational decisions do we need to be making? Do we need to um, turn off reclosers in your high fire threat district? Um, and then of course with your extreme, those are usually limited to our Santa Ana wind events where you have extremely dry vegetation, strong winds, uh, low relative humidity, basically all the factors are in line to have another catastrophic wildfire event. Um, this tool originally was used as just a company tool, but the more we began to talk about it, the more we began presenting it to different leaders within our communities, um, we realized that there, were, there was a need for it um, outside of our company. So we now also share this information with the San Diego County Office of Emergency Services, the Red Cross, um, and fire agencies across our service territory. Um, another tool that we've been lucky enough to develop is the wildfire risk reduction model. So this is essentially a fire behavior model um, that can tell us, given any pixel within our service territory, how a fire would grow based on, of course, your wind and your fuels information again, but also the slope of the terrain and um, what terrain features you have in the area. Based on this, we can also overlay our infrastructure so that we know what infrastructure would be at risk if a fire were to occur. Um, so we're also using this model as a way to prioritize our system hardening efforts. So based on this model, you know, we can, it's essentially simulating tens of millions of wildfires across um, a, a grid across our service territory every single evening. 
And once that occurs, it can highlight, as you can see on the map on the lower, uh, lower left corner of this, um, this slide, where your highest risk fire areas would be through the day. So you can see, you know, the areas that are highlighted as red are areas that you're expecting wildfire growth in excess of about 5,000 acres in eight hours. Um, whereas your blues, your yellows, are areas that you wouldn't expect the, the fires to spread as quickly. So once we have this information, we're able to, you know, begin um, basically assessing what information or what critical infrastructure we have in the area um, and begin preparing for what would happen if a fire were to occur in that area. And then we've also partnered with uh, UC San Diego and the High Performance Wireless Research and Education Network to install a network of cameras across the mountaintops within San Diego County. So it started out um, about 10 or 15 years ago with static cameras on mountaintops within San Diego County. So these would give us um, glimpses of your four cardinal directions, your north, south, east, and west from each mountaintop so that we could begin to get a, a glimpse of, um, you know, if a, a fire event were occurring, um, what the smoke plume looked like, what the, the growth of that plume was, so we could start to get an, an idea of how this fire was behaving. Last year, last October, um, we actually took these cameras a step further and installed new pan tilt zoom cameras on 16 mountaintops within San Diego County. So these cameras give us the functionality to triangulate wildfires. So if we see a smoke plume, we can point two cameras at it, um, see where the um, direction of those cameras crosses, and we're able to find a latitude longitude for the location of that wildfire. From there, we can do our um, wildfire simulations to know what infrastructure we have in the area. We can look at our weather stations to know exactly what the weather conditions are doing, where this fire has broken out. Um, so it just gives us an extra step in that situational awareness piece. We also share the Pantilt Zoom functionality with, of course, our partners with it, HP Ren, but also with um, CAL FIRE Dispatch Agency. Um, these are the folks who are dispatching fire crews to these wildfire incidents when they occur. So, you know, once they get the first report, they're able to immediately zoom in on these events or zoom in on these incidents and know or at least begin to generate an idea of what types of crews they need to dispatch to these fires. Um, whether it be air attack or if ground attack, if the fire activity is minimal enough to be able to be covered by just a ground attack. We also share the pan zoom functionality with the County Office of Emergency Services and Red Cross as well. All right, we're going to go. This is Augie Gio. Uh, my background is uh, over 36 years in the fire service before I came here to SDG&E. And uh, as far as our contract wildfire resources go, what we found is that when we put our people in, uh, in their scheduled work into areas that have a high fire threat uh, a rating uh, under, under extreme weather conditions, we will ensure that we have one of our contract firefighting crews uh, uh, prepared with them so that should we get an ignition, because our total objective here in SDG&E is no fire starts from our equipment or our work. But should a spark occur, should ignition occur, that contract firefighting resource is there with the truck, the water, the hose, the crew to assess the situation, put it out, call 911, and then bring in the local response agencies or CAL FIRE depending on where it is. And this has been uh, something that the fire service here in San Diego County, since the very inception of it, uh, really appreciated because they also had the objective of, of keeping every fire start in San Diego County to 10 acres or less. And we're helping to do that with the deployment of these contract firefighting resources. These resources are also available to the incident commander should after we get there, the fire uh, grow, or if we're working in an area where there is a fire, they can be attached to the uh, local command and utilized at the discretion of the incident commander. Uh, also, we have an industrial fire brigade. Uh, that industrial fire brigade is utilized for uh, fires at, let's say, a um, uh, where we have a transformer and we have a, um, uh, a fire in a transformer type setting. 
the local fire agencies do not generally have all the equipment or the sustained foam capability or the uh, uh, proper equipment to go in and mitigate that situation. So we'll respond out to those types of fires and check into the command post and let the incident commander know, listen, we're here, we have the training, the capability, the skill and experience to put this out. You can either use the equipment or you can use our crews to put it out. And most of the time they, they defer to us and, and allow our capstone crews to put those fires out. This equipment is staffed 24-7, 365 days a year, and it's very well integrated into our local fire departments, all 54 agencies throughout San Diego County through the incident command system. We also have our air resources to help mitigate our, 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 uh, our and, and assist in our fire prevention uh, stance. Uh, what we're very proud of is we recognize here in San Diego County, most of the time the fires will start up north like they have in the recent weeks. And when that happens, local resources go out, including air resources from Cal Fire. So we start to deplete local resources quickly. SDG&E wanted to make sure there was an effective uh, air support year round for fires in San Diego County in our service territory. So we have a contract with Ericsson Air Crane for the largest uh, aerial firefighting helicopter in the United States. Uh, this is available to all the firefighting agencies throughout our service uh, territory and it's capable of dropping over 2,600 gallons of water or foam at a time. And when you take a look at local a rotary wing that usually is 300 to 340 gallons, you can see the, uh, the massive capability of knockdown with the Ericsson Sky Crane. We also have a, a strong community outreach and collaboration uh, effort. Uh, we have over 40 stakeholder agencies that represent everything from local school districts, water districts, disability uh, rights advocates, uh, also consumer groups and, and fire departments. And we've worked really hard at SDG&E not only to establish those relationships, but to maintain them uh, so that we could have uh, a very effective uh, knowledge base uh, across the area of what's needed and how can we collaboratively work towards meeting those needs. Uh, we've worked with uh, those agencies for more than a year to develop our joint fire prevention plan. And something uh, on an aside, when you take a look at how we work with our fire departments, our outreach field and emergency readiness program meets with the fire chiefs every month to give them a briefing on our situation status with fire prevention, fire mitigation, our aviation assets, get feedback from them, and then work towards improvement into the future. Uh, additionally, we train uh, every year with every firefighter, every chief officer in the county, uh, and incident command to make sure that that relationship and that collaboration is done before the incident so that it goes well during the incident. Uh, firefighter agencies, like I said, we do meet monthly with the, with the county fire chiefs, um, and we actually support their efforts. Uh, sdg &E supports the annual wildfire drill with funding so that every agency in San Diego can get together and practice before the, uh, the fire season. We also have a strong relationship with the California Utility Emergency Association, CUEA. We're a member of the CUEA and in collaboration with electric, natural gas, water, telecommunications in the state of California, uh, CUEA serves as that point of contact for our critical infrastructure uh, utilities in the in state of California through the Office of Emergency Services during an event. So that uh, this slide describes our, our comprehensive fire prevention mitigation plan. And as, as you can see in, in our discussion, we have really evolved in the past 20 years from a focus on compliance and regulation to really driving to improve the fire science and understanding and then focusing on uh, truly effective fire risk management. And to do that, again, we have these three-prong approach 
you'll see on the, the far left side, situational awareness, minimizing ignitions, and then suppression and outreach. Katie talked a, a, a bit about the technology and partnering with academia and the Forest Service, CAL FIRE, to develop the Fire Potential Index, develop the Santa Ana Wildfire Threat Index, building out the weather network and continuously building that out as we are doing right now, uh, adding locations, and then being able to process that, that big data and um, understanding how you can, we could use that for modeling wildfire risk reduction. Um, and for minimizing the ignition sources, again, we've uh, worked on our 69 kV transmission system and our distribution system in the high-risk fire areas to uh, harden the system, increasing the clearances, between insulators, upgrading the size of the conductor, and just making a more resilient grid overall. Our vegetation management program has been recognized nationally as a uh, for the operational excellence. We're very aggressive with our vegetation management. We do go beyond what the uh, Public Utilities Commission requires as far as trimming to maximize our clearance. We maintain every one of our, our hazard trees in a GIS, so we have about 460,000 that are currently mapped uh, that we inspect each year. We also conduct sup supplemental uh, patrols before the highest, the height of the fire season and also are integrating LIDAR technology into our veg management program. Um, operational protocols, as we discussed, as Katie mentioned, the fire potential index, that index is used every single day by our, our field crews to determine what work is uh, at minimal risk, fire risk, and what work uh, needs to be conducted with a contract firefighting resource or other tools. We also uh, rely on that to adjust some of our relay settings during extreme events. Uh, to make them extra sensitive, so we will have sectionalizing devices trip off quickly. And then we also proactively stage field observers and contract resources based on the information, the intel that we have uh, from meteorology and our fire coordination group. And then again, to just recap on the suppression and outreach, so Augie mentioned the fine uh, fire coordinators that we have in our group. There's a com uh, over 200 years of combined experience with our fire, fire coordinators who are all former fire chiefs, all been in the industry for quite some time. Uh, we have a, a professionalized uh, staff of meteorologists. In fact, we're continuing to grow that. We just brought in a new uh, person who was uh, is graduating from San Jose State University in meteorology with a focus on fire, has interned with us for the past two summers, and in fact was a hotshot firefighter up in Northern California for 10 years. So we're, our, our continuous improvement and professionalizing our group is also ongoing. Um, and then emergency operations, just being able to scale up for an event and being able to collaborate and communicate with regulatory bodies, our uh, first responders, fire agencies, and customers is, is critical as part of our risk mitigation program. And with that, we're going to move from the general program to a discussion of a specific event that occurred in uh, December of 2017. Katie? Thank you. So back in December 2017, you keep, hear us talking, you keep hearing us talk about this event. Um, essentially, it was an unprecedented Santa Ana wind event. Um, for us, Santa Ana winds come in, easterly winds come in across the mountains and then downslope. Um, so we have the potential for catastrophic winds. Um, typically, these events will last for two, maybe three days at most. Um, and then you see a switch to onshore flow. During this event, we had an unusually long 13-day period of Santa Ana winds. Um, and though the winds were not at the same strength every single day, um, there were several days where we were noticing the forecast potential for up to 90 mile per hour wind gusts. So that prompted the National Weather Service to issue multiple red flag warnings. You know, at this point, typically in early December, we've received about two inches of rain at our airport and about 10 inches of rain across our mountains. But up to this point in 2017, we had recorded two hundredths of an inch of rain at our airport and not even two inches of rain in our mountains. So we were still extremely dry um, across our high fire threat districts. Um, the Santa Ana Wildfire Threat Index was rated extreme for all of Southern California, indicating that, indicating that this was an extremely high risk event. 
And even the U.S. Forest Service was saying that this would be one of the strongest offshore flow events in recent years. So um, this was all the information that we had leading into um, this catastrophic wind event. Okay. During those December 2017 wind events, uh, we activated our emergency operations center, and this was kind of unprecedented because we had a 13-day period of activation uh, during those winds, and and that was uh, something of a marathon event for all of our personnel associated with the EOC and supporting the EOC. We learned a lot out of that in our after-action review process. Also, we had to do extra staffing at our control centers to meet the demand and the duration of that type of an incident and the potential of the incident. We also established stationary and roaming observers so that we had eyes on the areas we needed in our infrastructure so we knew what was going out as long as it was safe for our personnel. We knew what was going on and the impact to, to our, our infrastructure during that event, throughout that event. We also uh, disabled our automatic reclosures as a, another level of safety to prevent ignition. Again, no fire starts from our, our infrastructure. And we, dis we enabled our sensitive relay settings to give us another advantage on that. We also canceled, and, and, and this is something we, we, we do uh, uh, often, we cancel the work in the fire risk areas. Uh, why put our personnel and why put the public uh, at risk if we know that we're going to be in a, a high-risk event? Uh, we also returned our air crane to San Diego at that time. That's what precipitated the uh, extension of the contract and then the decision to make it a 365-day-a-year program. Uh, and then we brought in additional firefighting resources like Katie uh, talked about earlier. Uh, we went from five contract firefighting units to about nine to meet the demand out there in the field. Because again, we had to have a contract firefighting resource with each of our crews uh, to de-energize and re-energize safely. And then we deployed our mobile command trailers for customer use because we knew there was an impact on our customers in some of these hard to reach geographical areas. So when the electricity went out, we wanted to make sure that they had a place where they could get some water, they could charge their cell phones, they could hook into the internet and send information out or get information on what was going on. And that's a program that we're actually expanding uh, as we speak. And then we ensured customer communications, very effective, very timely customer communications. We tried to get the information out there well in advance of any de-energization, but not only telling the customer, but informing the first responders, county OES, uh, every stakeholder that, that needed to know, we ensured they knew in a timely manner. And then we also did the same thing on the re-energization, so there was a complete communications loop going throughout the incident. One of the things that I, I want to bring up here, because we talked about the air crane. Uh, well, no, that's, that's later. Sorry, I was getting out of sync. Customer notifications. We're uh, communicating as early and as often as possible because one of the things we recognize is, is that our customers and the agencies that support them need to know what's going on prior to it happening. So we try to get out there at least 24 hours in advance, sometimes more often, if we know there's going to be an impact to their service. Uh, email, outbound call dialers, uh, text messages, internal websites, media events. We use every aspect of communications we can to ensure that the contact has been made with the customer. And we always remind customers to make sure that their contact information is up to date because we can only contact them if we have that up-to-date contact information. The communications begins when the National Weather Service declares the red flag warning event, and then we start encouraging the customers to activate their personal emergency plans. 
As the conditions change, which they do often during these events, the customers will receive uh, follow-up communications uh, as often as necessary, including when the power outage is imminent. So although we try to get to them in advance and give them time that we're going to be de-energizing, sometimes the conditions change so rapidly that we'll have to put out an imminent power outage notice to let them know it's going to impact them almost immediately. And then we also notify them when there's an outage that will extend overnight so that they can again be prepared for that, and then when the power restoration has begun. Uh, we also provide personal visits to my SDG&E customers if there are medically sensitive customers that are enrolled in our baseline, our medical baseline allowance program, and the temperature sensitive customers during de-energizations of emergency situations if the customer cannot be reached. So we're very sensitive to that. If we cannot reach a customer, we will send out a, a, a live point of contact to follow up on them. So in terms of how this event ended up shaping out at the end, um, what we saw after all was said and done was that we had 40 of our 170 weather stations at the time tie or break their Santa Ana wind gust records. Um, so these were stations that had been installed for as many as nine years at the time. Um, 40 of them gusted as strong as they ever have during Santa Ana wind events. We had 38 weather stations measure wind gusts in excess of 50 miles per hour, 12 in excess of 60, and four in excess of 70 miles per hour with the peak wind, uh, wind gust measured of 88 miles per hour at uh, one of our most famous weather stations in the area, Sill Hill. So one interesting part about the uh, situation in December that, that has raised quite a bit of attention in the state is when we did de-energize proactively our customers, certain customers for public safety, which is really a last resort effort. We've gone through a lot of our staging. Augie talked about all of our staging, our patrolling, our, our uh, sensitive relay settings. We take every step possible before we de-energize uh, proactively. But when we were facing a situation where, as you see on the slide, 17, where the director of CAL FIRE was telling us that in, in the midst of this, there would be no ability to fight the fire. It would only be a recovery effort, a rescue effort. Uh, we were seeing fires north of us and south of us in Los Angeles and in Mexico, and uh, the conditions were just right for, for having a, a serious catastrophic fire. We've de-energized for safety in the past uh, sparingly. And this time we did de-energize for uh, several times at different times with about 14 to 18,000 customers impacted over a series of days, re-energizing them as quickly as we possibly could. Interestingly enough, the, uh, the Public Utility Commission of California recently uh, is issued a resolution that requires all investor-owned utilities to have some sort of plan for de-energizing for public safety. Uh, so moving on to slide 18, so these are just some of the factors that are considered. When we activate, we have an op officer in charge, myself or, or one of our other executives sitting in the chair looking at all of the conditions. So is there a red flag warning? The Santa Ana wildfire threat index, which was extreme, indicating that a catastrophic fire would burn out of control. Uh, at the time. Humidities, we were seeing in December humidities of less than 5% uh, in much of our, our East County. And then high temperatures and high wind gusts. We also have observers, as mentioned earlier, roaming in the field and also stationed in the field as uh, on particular positions. And we'll continually ask them, what are they seeing as far as debris, vegetation, or impact to our lines? And then just what is the availability of firefighting resources, and in particular the, the aerial resources, are they able to fly at a certain uh, level of uh, wind speed? The helicopters in particular are grounded, and that can become very difficult uh, for the initial attack on the fire. Also, based on the wind speed, the drop of the retardant or water could be not as effective if, if it's a high wind speed. So these were some of the factors that we took into consideration when we did proactively de-energize. And now we're going to move on to, Katie's going to describe some an event that occurred just recently to really cap off that we do have a changing climate and we are seeing conditions that are serious throughout the year as far as heat and, and fire. 
Yeah, so on July 6th of this year, uh, we had an extreme heat event here in San Diego County, as Katie just said. Um, you know, we ended up seeing this event where all-time temperature records, you know, records that have been kept for over 100 years were shattered, um, including 117 degrees in one of our foothill locations that broke the all-time high temperature record of 111. Um, you know, we were able to see this event coming, but the thing that was different for it, you know, from a meteorological standpoint, the way the weather pattern set up, we would typically expect to see moisture coming into our area, which, you know, even though we did have east winds very similar to a Santa Ana wind event, typically when we see um, this weather pattern set up, it's bringing in moisture from either the Gulf of Mexico or the Gulf of California. So we end up seeing more of a thunderstorm risk than a fire risk. Um, unfortunately, with this event, though, we ended up seeing relative humidity down as low as 5% widespread across our service territory um, and all but our immediate coastline. So that ended up being the fuel that fed uh, six active fires within our service territory. Um, through that, we had over 2,000 acres that were burned, um, the, largest, uh, the largest fire that occurred off of a, um, the Camp Pendleton Marine Corps base. Um, was in the community of Alpine, another foothill loca location where it burned over 500 acres and ended up destroying um, many homes and, and structures. Um, so during this event, because we didn't have extremely strong winds, uh, we did not end up de-energizing de for safety. But we did end up seeing three outages that were related to that west fire that occurred in our community of Alpine. So it, it did impact almost 3,000 customers. Two of those outages were forced out by the fire. Um, and then we had one outage that was requested by the fire agencies. Part of our response during the West Fire was our air crane in support of other local government and CAL FIRE air resources, both fixed and rotary wing. Um, we had the initial fire, which was a smaller fire, burned 10 acres of building fire. We dropped about 449 gallons on that fire. And then we were diverted over and redispatched to the West Fire, where the air crane dropped uh, by itself 48,950 gallons. And this, this shows the the capability of such a heavy lift aircraft with 2,600 gallon drop capability. Uh, that fire was limited to 505 acres and in part because of the strong sustained uh, aerial bombardment of that. And the air crane, another good feature, uh, Katie talked about about the water dissipating sometimes under certain conditions before it hits the ground. We found with the air crane when it comes in, with the massive amount of water that we can drop in controlled drops, it can penetrate the canopy more easily than some of the medium lift helicopters that are out, out on the fires. This year to date, you'll see on the bar chart down below uh, that our, our highest year in the past was 2018 uh, in an entire season, 182,000 uh, 900 gallons of water. Uh, and you look to 2018 now, uh, we are actually up uh, over 190,000 gallons of water, and we're just now really starting what would normally be called, called fire season with the air crane. A couple of other elements I want to talk about, though, in aerial support is that SDG&E also believes that we've got to work towards safer platforms. So we have uh, purchased, designed and purchased, uh, I believe the first utility designed uh, medium lift aircraft through Airbus, an H145, which has twin engines and an enclosed tail rotor that we use for our construction purposes as well as line patrol when we have these red flag warning events prior to and post uh, during the re-energization process. We also have the ability to bring in multiple call when needed aircraft to to more rapidly conduct our assessments when we do have uh, the events where we have to de-energize so we can bring our customers back up as efficiently and effectively and timely as possible. So I think with that, we're going to conclude. And as Augie mentioned, that you know there used to be a, a normal fire season. And now in December of 2017, our Governor Jerry Brown noted that this is the new normal. We're we're facing a new reality where fires threaten people's lives, their property, their neighborhoods, and cost billions and billions of dollars. 
And that, that is true. That is what we're seeing at SDG and E, a new normal with changing climate, uh, the increased occupation in the wildland urban interface area. And we have our, our obligation to serve customers while mitigating this risk, which still remains the number one risk for us. So we just focus continuously on improving fire mitigation, emergency preparedness, and collaboration with the essential services, the policymakers, and the community leaders. So Daniel, with that, I think um, we're, we're concluding our remarks and are open for questions. Well, Katie, thank you, uh, and Augie, and, and Katie as well, for that incredibly comprehensive uh, overview of the program. I've had a few questions come in here, uh, and I'm, we've got about 10 minutes to get through as many as we can. If any of the other participants want to send in additional questions, please use the chat feature to send them to me, and I'll do my best to get to them. Uh, but first, one thing that uh, was asked here is uh, when you – uh, look back uh, at kind of where you began this um, uh, this effort to introduce some uh, and invest in some some new practices and uh, from from 2003 and 2007 to today. Are there certain um, performance metrics that you've looked at that have uh, given you insight into how effective some of these investments have been? Uh, for example, are you able to, to look at uh, sort of average rest restoration times for, uh, for wildfires? Um, and, uh, you know, what has been the experience over the last decade in, in understanding uh, how effective some of these investments have been in, um, in mitigating the, the challenges you're dealing with? Yeah, that's a great question, and we do, uh, we have actually an executive wildfire council that uh, every meeting we have certain metrics that are reported. They're also reported in our risk-informed GRC process, too, so we do need to provide metrics in there. I would say that uh, we have a double-edged sword, so we have um, meteorology uh, metrics that are not very promising. So our rainfall for this year has been significantly reduced. It's um, it, it, it's almost uh, or it is less than half of what our typical rainfall is to this year to date. So that's not a positive uh, metric for us. We also have our live fuel moisture, dead fuel moisture. We keep track of those percentages and are also seeing um, you know negative metrics on those. On the positive side, what we are seeing, and, and I would say is a result of the um, of the work that we've done is, for instance, we track the number of wire down events that we have and the number of wire downs specifically in our fire, high fire threat district. And what we're seeing is that, you know, that those numbers have been on the decrease. When we do have an incident where there's a wire down and there's a fire related to it, what we've seen typically are they're related to uh, mylar balloon contacts, animal contacts, a couple of vegetation contacts and then uh, carpool contacts, which result in a wire down and, and a fire. So those are some of the metrics that we use for that. And then we uh, are we do have a requirement in California to report uh, fires based on certain criteria. And so we've seen a decrease also in our PUC reportable fire metrics. So on the positive side, we've seen those you know the risk factors um, improving. On the meteorological side, we've seen a a, a negative. Uh, direction for our climate in, in the area. Okay. Um, a second question about the weather station system that you have set up and the cameras. Uh, actually, two questions. First, how did you go about deciding the placement of those cameras? And um, secondly, are they equipped to be able to automatically identify an alert um, uh, through sort of image recognition technology that spot fires are uh, occurring, or is it something that um, is more of a passive video feed that uh, can just be accessed by um, different fire crews? Great question. So in terms of the placement of the cameras, we tried to pick just some of the highest mountaintops in San Diego County. Um, those are going to be the places that give you the best vantage point um, to where you can have a, a pretty wide-ranging angle of what you can see across our county. 
Um, in terms of the you know recognition of wildfires, smoke plumes, things of that nature, uh, the cameras do have that functionality in them, um, but at this point we don't have that functionality to be turned on. Uh, what we found is, you know, being a, a coastal climate, when you have marine layer clouds coming in, um, even just the wispiness of those clouds at some points can trigger very false positives in terms of um, the smoke recognition. So to date, um, that hasn't quite been as useful as we were hoping it would be, um, but we're hoping that, you know, with technological advances, hopefully in the future we can have something um, that would, that we would be able to put in place. Great. Um, I have a, another question here about um, undergrounding. I think, Katie, you at the beginning mentioned um, the, the undergrounding was one of the strategies that you had used for um, your wildfire prevention and mitigation. Can you go into a little bit more detail about what factors went into the decision to underground lines or not in, in different cases? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say that it's just one tool in the toolbox and, and maybe not the first tool to, to look at um, because there's also uh, quite a bit of, it can be quite a bit of difficulty depending on terrain, uh, environmental factors. So some of our, our highly cultural sites or environmental sites, the uh, the undergrounding in those areas can be more destructive than just re rebuilding resilient overhead structures. Uh, so those are some of the factors that we consider is, you know, is this particular area maybe perhaps more an urban area or an urban interface? We've had, uh, we have the Cleveland National Forest, which is a substantial amount of our high fire threat area is encompassed by the, the forest. And in parts of that area and parts of that project, we received approval to be able to, to underground, but most of the time you need to underground along a road or within the road. You're gonna have your vaults that you'll install that allow your, your cable splicing and maintenance. And, and the maintenance is, it can be challenging, especially in areas that may see uh, shifting soil, or uh, if they do experience a burn, uh, you know, as we saw up in the, you know, the uh, Ventura area, once you have a burn and you lose the vegetation, you can be prone to mudslides. And so it, it's just, there's a very careful consideration that has to be undertaken with, with undergrounding. Um, I would say that another tool that we use uh, that's that's not undergrounding, for instance, is relocating lines. And that's to, that can be to our benefit as well as to mitigate fire risk. And that is moving lines out from heavily vegetated areas. And it may mean that you're extending the lines, but moving them away from heavily vegetated areas and then possibly, you know, the ideally closer to local access roads for our our, our utility workers. So there's, there's got to, it, it's a, a tool in, in the toolbox, but I would say that there are a lot of tools to look at and there have to be some serious considerations if, you know, for undergrounding to be proposed. Okay, great. Um, I'll maybe make this one the final question, but I wanted to ask uh, about how your work on wildfire prevention has uh, impacted sdg &E's overall approach to business continuity and resiliency um, have you found that, like, you, you mentioned uh, a, a lot of the investments that you've made in staff with specialized expertise that is relevant for uh, wildfire prevention, um, but, you know, wildfires are just one of a, a number of different risks that um, these, that, that you're worried about, uh, and I imagine that there may be some uh, benefits for these resources to uh, help with how you're preparing for other risks um, such as, uh, you know, other types of storms or earthquakes or uh, other, uh, you know, uh, sort of natural disasters. Have, um, have the lessons that you've learned in dealing with wildfires uh, led to any other changes uh, in terms of how SDG &E approaches um, resiliency. Um, I, yeah. You know, great question, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, we have a very strong uh, business uh, 
continuity program, and, and it's essential to, to any business, large or small. But what we found is that, it, it, as you said, it isn't just the – and although wildfire is our most significant threat, it's our number one risk in California regardless of who you are. Uh, we recognize that. But we can't discount that we have a lot of other risk factors out there, and our job in emergency management is to be prepared for all of those to the greatest degree possible. But we learn a lot from these wildfire planning, preparedness, response, and recovery operations. Uh, one of the things we learned is that Although we had some level of plans, we really needed to make something more user-friendly. So we went into what's called a concept of operations system, where for the different events, whether it's wildfire, other weather-related events, uh, financial issues, um, uh, earthquake, uh, any of those other more significant man-made or natural events, uh, cybersecurity, uh, we need a concept of operations that will walk us through that event uh, in an organized manner so that we capture everything that needs to be considered uh, uh, previously, during, and, and post-event so that we can get into the recovery. So that that's what we do. Uh, we also found that because, and we're, we're experiencing this right now uh, in, in Northern California with the fires that are going on uh, over there uh, over uh, an extremely uh, prolonged period of time, that part of our planning has to include mutual uh, aid or, or uh, mutual support uh, in and out of San Diego uh, County. And a lot of that is mostly driven by the weather-related events currently. So we're finding that being more prepared for that, being more organized, having concepts of operations that will guide us with incoming and outgoing uh, uh, mutual aid is, is important for us. Wonderful. Well, Katie, Augie, and Katie, thank you all so much for spending the time today to walk us through all the work that you're doing. It's really impressive and not a surprise that you received an award for all of this work and the dedication that you all have shown in this area. So uh, with that, I am going to conclude our webinar for today. If anyone uh, has additional follow-up questions, you can contact uh, us at international at eei.org and we can put you in touch with um, uh, folks at SG&E, and, &E, and we'll be posting the webinar recording on our YouTube channel, and all of the participants will get a link to that as soon as it's posted. Um, thank, thank you very much for all the participation. Appreciate it, and thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. Bye-bye.